I think it's real important when you begin talking about Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Essenes, those three triangulations, to separate out the issues. And it's really kind of simple if you'll think of it systematically. One of the issues is, are the Dead Sea Scrolls connected to the site of Qumran? Qumran's a place that's been excavated by Deveau in the 50s. The scrolls are found in caves around the Dead Sea. So an obvious question that occurs to anybody is, oh, here's this ancient site, pretty near Cave 1, Cave 3, uh, the whole Cave 4 complex. I wonder if the people who lived at that site might have had something to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls. You see how that's a discrete question that you could address. Now, a second question is, when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, forget Qumran for a moment, the site, but the scrolls, you read the scrolls, you find in what we call the sectarian texts, the community rule, the war rule, the thanksgiving hymns, really a lot of the scrolls from cave one, you find a self-identified, self-aware, apocalyptic group. They call themselves various things. People of the way, new covenanters, the Yachad, which means basically the community. And we know from those scrolls that they're preparing the way in the wilderness, picking up on Isaiah 40, verse 3. And they believe they're living in the time of the end. They're waiting for the two messiahs, the messiah of David and of Aaron. They're pre-Christian. I think that's very important, although that's disputed by a few people, not by many of us. And I think in some ways in Qumran studies, you should pay attention to consensus. It's always fun to be a maverick and say, oh, well, I doubt everything. But on the other hand, when James Vanderkam and Peter Flint and Emmanuel Tove and you know, some pretty intelligent people look at the scrolls and come up with conclusions, I would at least pay attention to the arguments. And uh, I, I think we should. And so what do we find in the scrolls? This uh, community, this apocalyptic end of days community from before the time of Jesus, roughly from the Maccabees down to the destruction of the temple, or let's say the Jewish War 68. So that's a nice spread of, of dates in which these scrolls were written, based on paleography, the work of Frank Cross and others, and uh, the radiocarbon dating of the scrolls. Uh, most of them, the flourishing point is about 50 BC. You get a couple like the Habakkuk Pesher from Cave One, that's in the first century AD, but most of them are from about 50 to 100 years before the time of Jesus. Many of us are convinced, again, a kind of a consensus, that the teacher that led the group is to be dated in that first century BC. So he, he's probably 50 to 75 years before the time of Jesus. Now, for Christians, the stir about the scrolls is that within the scrolls, there are all these parallels to the Jesus movement that, that gets picked up, let's say, 50 to 75 years later. Jesus flourishes around 30 AD. And if the teacher flourished, say, 50, 75 BC, you got about 100 years later, you get another movement. It's a messianic, apocalyptic baptism movement preparing the way in the wilderness, calling itself the new covenanters and, and also people of the way, you see? So when this was first discovered, it, called it, it caused a kind of electrifying uh, response with the press because is this like a pre-Christian Christianity and maybe everything in early Christianity is therefore really derived as is like copied or plagiarized from the Dead Sea group or in fact maybe the Dead Sea group is in some ways what became the early Christian movement as Eisenman and others have argued. He calls it the Messianic movement in Palestine. It wouldn't really be Christianity as such, but the Jesus movement. And so the parallels are there, and yet there are also differences I think that you're well aware of. Uh, the book that I would most recommend if you want a, a, I think, a really sound and solid book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, as much as uh, you really need, even at an advanced level, would be Vanderkam and Flint's book, uh, The Introduction. I, I think it's something like The Meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls or The Dead Sea Scrolls, something or other. 
but Vanderkam and Flint. Uh, it, it's a nice, substantial sized book, and it really does survey all the issues. It's quite up to date. So you ask then the question, uh, is, is the group, are the scrolls connected to the site first? And second, can we identify the group that wrote the scrolls, the sectarian group that we read about in the scrolls that self-consciously describes itself and its beliefs and its founding and its teacher, can we identify that group in any other sources? Is, is it a phantom, mysterious group never mentioned in any contemporary sources, Josephus being the major source of the period, the New Testament writings being another source, or in fact, is the group that wrote the scrolls to be identified with some Jewish group that we know something about? Most scholars have answered yes, yes, meaning the site is connected to the scrolls and the writers of the scrolls are indeed identified in classical sources such as Josephus and Pliny and Philo as the Essenes. Okay, so that's the so-called Essene hypothesis. It's got, uh, I, would, I would call it a soft hypothesis in that it has caveats to it. That is, I would generally hold that hypothesis, but then I would want to ask you if you challenge me, which I hope some of you will do, you know, why do you think the scroll writers were Essenes? My first question to you would be, what's an Essene and how do you know what you know about Essenes? As it can become a kind of a word game uh, because we, we don't know, the, they never call themselves Essenes. So it's not their word, unless Gorenson and a few others are right, and they might be that it's actually a corruption, or not a corruption, a uh, Greek uh, version of the word osim, the doers of the Torah. And I'm sort of fond of that possible explanation. But as far as the clear Greek word essen, obviously it's not in the scrolls, because the scrolls aren't written in Greek, right? Except for a very few, uh, I think, from Cave 7. So that doesn't help us much. So uh, you have to ask, what do you mean by Essenes? And uh, the only thing you know about Essenes is primarily Josephus, a little bit from Pliny, a bit from Philo, a bit from Strabo. These classical sources are all quoted in Vanderkam and Flint's book and thoroughly discussed. So the point is, let's say, I, if I say to you, well, I think the group that wrote the scrolls should have the label Essene, what, what have I gained except a label? Unless you bring to your understanding of Essenes some information that then would add and correlate with things in the scrolls. So that's what we try to do. Believe it or not, this particular topic of the latrines at Qumran does bring together Essene classical sources as well as sources in the scrolls. That along with the cemetery evidence is, is the only thing you know, the only material evidence I know that, that, that really does that in, a, I think, a pretty definitive way. So uh, that's what I want to introduce you to as we talk about this identification. Now, before I get into this data, I will mention, and surely most of you know this, that uh, Itzar Hirschfeld, who passed away this week, uh, very sadly, uh, has his major book on Qumran, arguing that that settlement has nothing to do with the scrolls, and it is a villa. It's a, a country villa, a country manor. Uh, so you've got that view. You've got the Dancil view. These have all been covered in bar. So if you get bar on CD or you have old issues, this issue has been very thoroughly covered. The Dancils uh, from uh, Ecole Biblique uh, way over a decade ago uh, explored this idea of the, the villa and uh, argued that the pottery and the different objects that Qumran pointed to a different kind of identification. Norman Golb, uh, who recently got a lot of attention in the Chicago Tribune as a gainsayer of Qumran identification with the Essenes and Qumran identification with the scrolls. He would be a no, no man, see? And I'm a yes, yes man on those two questions. He would say, no, the scrolls aren't identified with the site, and no, the Essenes are not the ones who wrote the scrolls. He argues that it's an eclectic library of Jewish literature from the time of the revolt that was brought together from various places, and I think you're pretty familiar with that. He has a book on it. 
And then we also had, uh, he argues that the site then is a military fortress, by the way. So you got country villa, military fortress, and last but not least, uh, I guess it's the, is it the current issue of Barr or the issue before? I think it's the issue before last. Uh, the argument based on um, it's Itzhak Magain and his uh, student, Yuval Peleg, uh, are arguing that it's a pottery factory. So I'll talk about all that uh, today. But those are other proposals. The vast majority of material archaeologists, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a textual person. I study archaeology and I do some archaeology and I listen to archaeologists. But the vast majority of those who work in archaeology in the field at Qumran, Jody Magnus being, I think, the most notable, uh, still maintain the identification with the Essenes and with the scrolls. She's a yes, yes woman, okay, on those two questions. Now, it's very interesting. Herschel Shanks, you know him, the editor of VAR, he once put it like this to Jody Magnus. This is in Jody's preface. I'm going to just read it, the preface to our book, Archaeology of Qumran, which to me is the best one stop shop for Qumran archaeology. It will not be superseded for a long time. And, uh, you know, Jody's impatient with alternative views. She, <laughs> she simply feels that it's a slam dunk. It's an open and shut case. Qumran is not a complex site. I mean, there are sites that you cannot make any sense of, Steve, like the Suba Cave. It's an extremely complex site with 10, 20, 30 layers you know, with lots of interpretation. Qumran is not such a complex site. The essential interpretation of DeVoe still stands, with just some minor adjustments in chronology and pottery dating. But anyway, Herschel said to Jody, would we interpret Qumran as a religious sectarian settlement had the Dead Sea Scrolls not been found? Herschel knows how to really get to things with the question. <laughs> See? In other words, imagine suddenly, no scrolls, we're just archaeologists, oh, I think there's a ruin there. Hmm, let's dig it and see what we find. In other words, to what degree does our reading of the scroll shape and form our interpretations of the material, almost wholly non-textual evidence found at the site? I say almost wholly non-textual because no scrolls have been found at the site. So we're not talking about scroll material at the site, we're talking about pottery and rooms and floors and latrines and or a latrine and ovens and other kinds of things. Magnus replied that she did not think we would interpret it as a religious settlement, but neither would we conclude that it was a villa or a fortress. Interesting. And he, she doesn't think the archaeology is definitive enough to say, I, I think what she's essentially saying is people live there. <laughs> uh, and they had a, a relatively modest lifestyle. So what we really have is uh, scrolls and text to get, uh, that is text and material evidence together that we want to consider together and see what we come up with. Uh, if you think about a site with no text or text with no site, it's not something you wish for, it's something you usually get. Like we have all sorts of ancient texts floating around, no site. They weren't found anywhere that might be connected to their writing. And we have lots of sites with no text. You just dig the site or maybe you get a few texts, but not full text. It's somewhat like Masada. Even though Masada is quite controversial with some people uh, about, you know, was it really the site of the Zealot last stand and so forth. Uh, I still think it was, but we do have a text, don't we? We have Josephus' account of the last stand, and we have the site, and then a few texts even found at the site. So that's a lot like Qumran. We read one in the light of the other, and the other in the light of the one. So let me start, before I get to latrines, uh, we'll do toilets and death, uh, because Josias has really been a pioneer in both of these, the cemetery evidence. Now, Jody's not necessarily focusing on the cemetery. She's talking about the site itself, the buildings, and the pools, 
and the storage rooms and so forth. You know, would we necessarily say, oh, it's a religious sectarian group living here waiting for the end of the world? Because it's never written on the walls. The end is coming soon, right? That's not there. Uh, so, but if you look at the cemetery, it gets more interesting. Because of the 1,100 or so graves that we used to thought, we used to think had a fair amount of women also buried there, Zayas, I think, has now successfully shown that there are, there's maybe one female, if any, because that one's not clear at all, the sexing of the skeleton. But in terms of those other six that we thought for a long time were women, they are women. But guess what? They're Bedouin. They're late. They're on the peripheral of the cemetery. They have nothing to do with the ancient site. So isn't it a bit odd? And I think it's the biggest problem of Magain, and I don't mean Magain Broshi, right? Keep your Magain straight. Yitzhak Magain and Golb even. Uh, how do you have an all-male cemetery right at the backyard of the site uh, with, with uh, these uh, Jewish burials oriented north-south, not toward Jerusalem? Sounds a bit sectarian, right? I mean, the head should be to the east and the feet should be to the west so that when the bodies are raised up, you're facing Jerusalem. These people are facing the north. The head is at the south, the feet are at the north. So if the body comes up, it's north. We'll see slides in a minute. We don't know what that means. That's the case of, you look at the material evidence, say, oh, the skeletons are already in the north-south, and they're all male. If you didn't have the scrolls and Josephus, I don't know that you could make anything about that other than what an odd cemetery, <laughs> you know? But no grave goods, simple linen burial shrouds, uh, uniform pattern of burial with this orientation. Why not bring in the scrolls and see if we can make some guesses? After all, archaeology always proceeds on hypotheses, and as long as the hypotheses are good ones, there's nothing wrong with that. So what would be a hypothesis? These people are looking to the north. Why? They're wedded to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And what does Isaiah say? Isaiah 9, the Christians pick up on this. The people in the north will see a great light. The son of David comes from the north, Isaiah chapter 9, right? And what are they waiting for? They're waiting for the redemption to come from the north. I don't know if that's why they buried north-south, but it, you know, it begins to fill in a little bit of possibility. The all-maleness of the community is not in the scrolls. The scrolls do not specify a celibate community, per se. But Josephus talks about two kinds of Essenes, right? Those who marry and have children that live in all the villages throughout the land on the outskirts, and those who practice celibacy. The hypothesis that DeVoe and most of us uh, from that time have worked on is that this is the spiritual headquarters of the elite. I don't know that we should call them Jewish monks because that kind of becomes uh, an archaic anachronism to say monks per se. But what about dedicated Jewish males that have joined the yakad or the community waiting for the time of the end and trying to live this incredibly ritually pure life? We say ritually pure. Notice they wouldn't use words like richly pure. They would just say pure. There's no difference in purity. Purity is pure. It means that God's spirit can dwell in the camp. That's all it means. Now, why couldn't God's spirit dwell in the camp? Because of death, sex, menstruation, uh, toilets, and others, all the defilements that are in the city. Sex in the city has a new meaning. One of the things in the scrolls, we're going to look at the text in a minute, uh, there's not to be sexual activity in the city of the holy sanctuary. Now, they know that they cannot overthrow Roman rule in a day and change the whole Jewish secular population or even the Jewish religious population to follow these strict laws of halakha, you know, of ritual purity, as we call it. But they can, in a representative way at Qumran, this is our hypothesis, most of us, <coughs> represent for the rest of the group as monks and nuns later did for the Christians, a standard of holiness that will be kind of the front line of the community. 
<coughs> to demonstrate to God the seriousness with which the people have repented of their sins after returning from the exile and are determined to keep all of the laws of God and all the commandments of God without fail and faithfully with great dedication. <coughs> Some Christians have a problem with this because they don't understand Judaism. They think it's legalism. But within Judaism, to obey God very meticulously is not Judaism. I mean, it's not legalism. It's the height of spirituality. That is, if you want to be close to God, why wouldn't you want to do the things that God has commanded you to do, the mitzvot, the commandments, right? So if you open up the community rule, it doesn't start out, here's a list of the 5,500 things you better do or God will zap you. It has a very moving testimony to the two ways and the goodness of the good way and how we should be drawn to it and how our soul should be attached to God. It's got a deep spirituality to it. And at the end, there's this very lovely prayer that says, among other things, before I move my hands and feet, I will praise you, O Lord. Now, I mean, that's not something to denigrate or put down from the standpoint of, well, these people are keeping all of these crazy fanatical laws, therefore, you know, they're legalists. Legalism is a category that developed from, uh, I think, certain kinds of Christian thinking, particularly Luther and Protestantism, that the law of Moses is this great burden. And if you keep the law, you're under bondage, right? Reading certain passages in Galatians from Paul. But that's not a Jewish understanding. Uh, a Jewish understanding would be, oh, how I delight in all of your commandments. They're my meditation all the day. And that doesn't mean violate them then, right? It means, like, do them. So their piety is to do the doers of the Torah, but also lots about loving God, lots about uh, repentance and faith. If you've ever read the Thanksgiving hymns, they sound like Paul, except for the doing the commandment part. Uh, they talk about, uh, I am hopeless before God. My righteousness is a filthy rag. There's nothing I can bring before the Lord. The Lord is holy. I only come with repentance and faith. I mean, it, it sounds very Christian as Christianity later, you know, devoted itself to these notions of repentance and faith, the way to turn to God, all the way through the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I want to remind you of that before I get to the latrines, because people always snicker and kind of think, oh, latrines, what's that all about? That could have nothing to do with spirituality. It has very much to do with spirituality if you're interested in the Bible and the Torah, as these people were. So... Uh, the, the cemetery evidence is, is very important to us because it uh, tells us uh, how they're living out in the wilderness, uh, evidence of a male community. And now with the latrines, we've got a new connection to the cemetery. You're going to be surprised if you haven't read the news stories, but there's actually a connection. So uh, actually, I just wanted to point out, this is really elementary. Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee land of Roman Palestine, Judea, Samaria, Galilee. So we're talking about this area right here, for those of you who've never been to a bar seminar. Uh, this is the Oxford map of Jerusalem. The colored area inside is the present wall today. This is very important because if you're driving around the city on the north and also on the west, you are tracing the wall. But right here, you make a turn and this is uh, leading to the Hinnom Valley, and you think this is the old wall, the Dung Gate, you know, the Western Wall, and so forth. But look at all of this area that was in the city in the time of Herod. Very important to remember that. I mean, it, it's it, it's almost a, it's another third of the city you're missing. See, when you talk about the whole city. Now, at this juncture right here on Mount Zion is the Gate of the Essenes. Uh, there have been several articles published. Pixner and I did uh, the major article, I guess, on this, uh, about the Essenes living in this quarter here. Uh, I've changed my view on this uh, in talking to Shimon Gibson. I've become convinced that the Essenes did not live in the city here, but, but the gate of the Essenes leads out to where they live, and they're living outside the city in the Hinnom Valley. I hate to say in hell, but... Uh, uh, 
And, and the reason they won't live in the city is the city's contaminated or defiled. And I guess it shows you that people are willing to change their minds because some of you know there's no more uh, person, there's no one who advocated Pixner's views as strongly as I did. And I was utterly convinced that Christian Mount Zion, which is this highest place in Jerusalem, was the Essene quarter. And that's where they lived, and that's where Jesus ate the Last Supper and so forth. And I've just decided I was incorrect on that. And Gibson has convinced me of this. He also has excavated with Mag and Broshi the whole western wall here. And this area we're going to excavate in March. It'll be in the Bar magazine January. I hope some of you will come and participate for three weeks. Right here, actually, I, let's see, I'm sorry. Right here is where the excavation will be, right here, not down here. That would be the right there, uh, outside the Turkish wall. This area, as far as we know, is the wealthier. It's Herod's palace. It's the palace gardens. It's, it's not where the Essenes lived, uh, according to what I, I'm now thinking. So I think they're living outside the city. That would fit what Josephus says. Doesn't mean they never go in the city. But essentially, uh, they, they feel that the city of Jerusalem is, is corrupt. So here's what they've done. Uh, nice shot, huh? <laughs> this is, uh, here's the old city. Now again, tracing the southern perimeters, it would go like this. Around like this and down and then down like this and around like this. This is where we're going to excavate, right in the center right here. So this whole area was the city. But look, there's the Dead Sea on a clear day. You almost never see this anymore. But quite a few times in the 70s and 80s, you could, you, before the air pollution, you could go up on the top of the Mount of Olives, which is right here. It doesn't look like from this perspective it's very high. And you could see the Dead Sea that clearly. You still can occasionally on a really clear morning after it's rained in the winter. So it's not very far. This is just 15 miles. You take the Jericho Road down. Why have they gone out into this wilderness of Judea, the group that wrote the scrolls? Whether they're Essenes or not, we'll beg that question for a minute, right? Whether they're Essenes or not. The group that wrote the scrolls, why are they out here? Because they see this wilderness of Judea as the place, they call it the Arava, where they are to prepare the way of the Lord. And so the sectarian community has stationed themselves right here on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. I'm speculating here, but I think the reason they've stationed themselves here is Moses is buried right here at Mount Nebo. They're directly across from Pisgah and Nebo. And I think for them, symbolically, they're waiting for Exodus 2, a prophet like Moses. In other words, it's like retracing history. The last time we really heard from God and heard the voice of God with the mighty prophet was Moses. Moses is now buried. We're preparing the way in the wilderness. Jerusalem's over here. It's corrupt. And if we live a life of purity and service to God, then God will fulfill his promises and fulfill all the words of the holy prophets. And the scrolls are full of quotations from Isaiah and Habakkuk and Jeremiah and uh, the other prophets, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and so forth. Now, here's a schematic drawing. Qumran, the site, cave one to the north, cave 11, cave three is actually right there, and then cave four clustered around. Um, why identify the scrolls with the site? The best argument is because they're in the backyard, <laughs> so to speak. I mean, they're just there. But there are other reasons to identify. This is cave one. It is to the north, as you could see on the map there. It's up here, a couple kilometers to the north. A little hard to find. But it had uh, the mother load of scrolls when you think about it. Everybody talks about cave four, the fragments. But you know, for years, I taught all of my classes, because we didn't have the other scrolls, right, in the 80s and 70s. I taught all of my classes with the little slim version of Vermish, the English edition. I think I used the second edition. Basically, it had the scrolls from Cave One. That was enough. You know, people say, I want the other scrolls. When will we get them? <laughs> I always tell this story about this woman who came up to me in the 90s. She said, oh, I'm so glad, you know, Herschel, we finally got the scrolls, Eisenman, Taylor, you guys, Michael Wise. And she said, I just can't wait. And I said, well, have you ever read the scrolls we have? She says, I haven't read them yet, but I plan to, you know. <laughs> 
And I think with a lot of us, not bar people, of course, but uh, uh, frankly, the community rule, the war scroll, the Thanksgiving hymns, the Habakkuk Pesher, I've just named scrolls from Cave One, they've had for 60 years. There's hardly anything that you can't do just with those scrolls. What I'm going to do today on the latrines is from the scrolls from Cave One. So, of course, I'm glad to have the other 40, 50 percent, depending on how you count the fragments. We want all we can get. But it's not as though you know, we knew nothing. Uh, we've really been in very good shape. We should be so grateful because the Cave One scrolls were largely intact, right? And just to, I mean, it should send, it should send shivers up your spine to think about, uh, this was blocked up, by the way. Uh, or they, they removed the stones blocking it. All you saw was this hole here. And uh, to think uh, of the, I think there were nine jars in that cave. One had the scrolls, you know, the seven scrolls in it, including the Isaiah scroll. I mean, just to hold in your hands to look at a document from the first century BC of a religious apocalyptic community preparing the way in the wilderness, waiting for the end. You know, there's just nothing like it. Uh, and and that, it's, that it's from the time. Uh, here's an aerial shot. You've all seen this many times, I'm sure, of, of uh, Qumran as it's been excavated. There's the cave four complex. The other caves are right here, literally in the backyard. And then there are three caves to the north. Uh, I want you to remember this pool here. We're going to come back to it quite a uh, a bit. This is on the northwest part of the site as we start talking about the layout of the community. What can we tell from the material of it? Here's the cemetery, and then there's this system of pools that runs through. There's the K4 complex. I say complex because it has A and B to it, not just one complex. This was cut by the archaeologists. This, someone actually slipped and fell down into K4. But here's, here's the edge of the site. There's K4. A picture of Golb uh, I put in because he's been in the news lately contradicting everything I'm saying today. <laughs> so uh, uh, he's from the University of Chicago also. And he has his singular view. And uh, I think he's incorrect. But he certainly has the right to continue to argue it. And I, I recommend his book on the scrolls. It's got great wealth in it uh, to read. But uh, he's one of the main scholars now that, unfortunately, Hirschfeld died this week tragically and very early, I think he was 55, who very rigorously is maintaining that the site has nothing to do with the scrolls. Uh, now, do you remember this? In 1996, Jim Strange and his team accidentally found a ostracon, this is what it sort of looks like, but it's uh, dated uh, to the year two. Uh, we think that means the year two of the revolt, so that would be 62, just like the coins use that. And among other, th it's written by somebody named Choni. You can see here, if you know Hebrew, this is pretty easy Hebrew to read. But this line right here, he's giving his fields at Jericho and other possessions and the right to some fruit trees. And he's giving it perpetually le yachad, to the yachad. But look at the D right there. The, the dalit is broken off, unfortunately, right there. And so Golb is saying, and others, not too many others, most of us are pretty sure, uh, he's giving over his uh, goods to the community. It fits well with the uh, Josephus reading about how you come to the community, you give up all your possessions, also the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was the first extensive text ever found at the site. And what does it do? It confirms for us how someone as late as 68, just right before the end, is still saying, I believe this message. I have faith in God. I'm going to give my goods and come over and be part of the Yachad. So that was a very important find. And it's now published in the English translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls. To get the latest edition of Vermish, the probably the most accessible English version. There's also uh, Wise, Abeg, and Cook, Wack, uh, English translation. And there's also uh, uh, Martinez, 
who, who's very good as well. So it's like buying Bibles, you know, have several translations. Probably have all three, but very much is paperback and easy to get. If you look at your handout, you've got some texts we're going to begin looking at. I'll start with one that's not on your handout that becomes the basis for the rest. I mentioned this is a pious community. They want to follow God. They want to obey God. And in the Torah scroll of Deuteronomy, which becomes the basic statement of Jewish law, uh, we have this command, Deuteronomy 23, verse 12. If you just want to write that somewhere on the page, Deuteronomy 23, verse 12. You shall have a designated area outside the camp. This is Moses telling the Israelites anciently. To which you shall go. With your utensils you shall have a trowel, like a paddle of some type. And when you relieve yourself outside the camp, you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God walks among the camp to save you and to keep you from your enemies. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. So this notion that's a technical term to go outside the camp was understood various distances, but clearly not in the general living area. So this is Israel in the wilderness. That becomes one of the 613 mitzvot of Judaism. It's got its number in Maimonides and in the Shulchan Aruch. You know, some, I don't remember the number. But it's a positive command, not a negative. It's one of the positive. You shall go out and have these latrines. There's also a mitzvah commandment in the Torah. It's in Numbers where someone's gathering sticks on the Sabbath to make a fire. You're not supposed to kindle a fire. And so Moses expands the law of not building a fire to say, don't even go out of your dwelling on the Sabbath. Do all your cooking, all your gathering of wood on Friday. And on the Sabbath, he says, don't go outside your dwelling, outside your camp. Now, can you put two and two together and see the problem? If on the Sabbath you can't go outside the camp, but you're commanded to go outside the camp, to have the latrines located at the proper distance, if you're going to try to follow this strictly, as they certainly wish to do, it becomes a problem. One of the things that the Pharisees are good at doing, we think, Christians think of the Pharisees as conservative and legalistic. It's a great misunderstanding of ancient Judaism. Pharisees are the liberals. They're the Hillel people. Even Shammai is liberal on this issue. They always find ways to make it people to be able to live. You know, you got to live. So even in Jerusalem today, you see Orthodox Jews walking all over the city. I'm not talking about just the old city. You can walk anywhere in Jerusalem. Why? Because they've got a thread, a small thread around the whole city up on the telephone poles, very high up. And it's a wire, and it makes the whole city an enclosure that you can then define as the camp. And other little villages around Jerusalem have this as well. So you're not going outside the camp because you redefine the camp, you know, as all the suburbs of uh, the new city of Jerusalem and the old city as well. That's a kind of a Pharisaic idea that, you know, there are always allowances, uh, ways to accommodate people's human needs because God is not a tyrant. Now here's a shot from up above Qumran. You can see the settlement down in this area. And I want you to see how it's located precipitously with cliffs on three sides, only to the northwest are you able to walk out onto the plateau. Just remember that. That becomes important for what we're talking about. Now, when you get to the northwest edge, you see this pool, a step pool, uh, where you go down and back up. The latest article in Bar that Herschel wrote in summarizing essentially the Pottery Factory view would argue that this whole water system has to do with the uh, cleaning of clay, the filtration of clay, and a sort of clay manufacturing depot. 
Uh, and I, I'm not at all convinced of this. Uh, I, I will tell you something rather interesting, Steve. You mentioned SUBA. The latest evidence on SUBA, we haven't even published it yet. Forget John the Baptist. This is 800 years before John the Baptist or Jesus. We think that huge SUBA complex was a clay manufacturing site. We're, we're quite sure of it, actually. And uh, it, it's becoming very interesting. Be, but it has to do with what we found in the pools in terms of deposits. And uh, I'm going to leave it to Shimon Gibson, because he's really the expert on this, to clarify it. In these particular pools, uh, we would want to compare our site at Suba, because we have pools as well at Suba, the so-called John the Baptist cave, uh, which is Iron Age, uh, and good clay in the valley very good clay, and a natural fed spring feeding the pools. The reason we were able to show that it's a clay factory is by examining the walls of the pools. So I could be wrong. If we now take our evidence and go to Qumran and look at, it's in the plaster, and we do really find evidence of this same kind of clay making activity, then we could get a matchup. But at this point, I'm not convinced that that's the case. This is Hirschfeld's uh, drawing, which uh, I think really does capture uh, the site as it was in the first century BC. As you come in to the northwest, which is the only way you can come in, here's the cemetery, here's Wadi Qumran with the steep precipice and some two-story buildings, here's the tower. The first thing you come to is this ritual pool of immersion that Simply, you go down the steps, and it goes nowhere. It's not practical for clay manufacturing. It's a very small pool at the bottom. I have other pictures of it. What is this, then? What I'm going to argue, and what I'm convinced of, is that this is the site of the spirit, let's call it the spiritual headquarters of the group that wrote the scrolls. This is where the elite celibate community lives. It doesn't mean nobody else can ever come. But in terms of the holiness of the camp, they are trying to live very strictly according to the Jewish laws as they interpret it. We now have MMT, you know, that gives us some of their halakhic interpretations. They're to the right of the Sadducees, and they agree with some of the Sadducean interpretations. The most common that I could illustrate that you probably heard about is the controversy of pouring a stream of water from a pitcher to a glass. I could demonstrate here, but I won't. So I hold the pitcher up, imagine, into a glass. Uh, if the water is clean and the glass is unclean, and I, I don't touch the glass, I just pour the stream of water, is the pitcher now defile the water in the pitcher? Pharisees, no. It didn't touch. The water is clean. It just went into the dirty, into the defile glass. Now in the glasses, is richly impure. What do the Essenes say in MMT? Yes, because impurity travels up the stream of water, and uh, it's like conducting electricity, and it, it makes the whole container defile. Now, as a modern, rational, secular person, you might say, oh, that is so crazy. I mean, who would ever think of such ridiculous uh, concerns? I think that's a misunderstanding of religion and a misunderstanding of ritual purity. Ritual purity is not dirt. You could be so scrubbed down that your skin was pink and almost raw from soap and lye, and if you touch a dead body and then go surgically scrub yourself, it has nothing to do with that defilement. Ritual cleanliness is separation of the sacred and the profane. Eliade taught us that, right? the sacred and the profane. It has to do with areas of life that become holy to God, where God's spirit can dwell, where people are concentrating, even though they're human beings living in the world, completely and wholly upon the spiritual things. Now, they have to still live. If they die, we bury them outside the camp. If they need to go to the toilet, they can go outside the camp. But when you come back in, the food is holy, the vessels are holy, everything is holy. Holy means separated. 
That's what the, the Hebrew word means, kadosh. It doesn't mean dirty, clean, or anything Western. Most of you know that. But a lot, obviously, the way the translations go, clean and unclean, it sounds like, oh, they're going in the mikvah because they're dirty. No, they're going in the mikvah because they did a very human, mortal thing. Notice what's forbidden. Blood, sex, death, defecation, signs of our mortality. They want to picture the temple of God right here. The camp is the temple. You say, well, there's no temple there. The people are the temple. The scrolls say, build me a tabernacle of men. Very important. Christians pick up on that, don't they? They say, you Christians are the temple. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Your altar is your heart. Offer up a holy sacrifice to God of your heart. This is not a Christian idea. It's a Jewish idea. It's also hinted at in the Torah, right? Rend your heart, not your garment, that sort of thing. So the, temp the temple is the people living in holiness here, and bodily functions are to be removed from the camp, and you eat the pure meal of the saints. It's like Holy Communion. No one can taste of the pure meal of the saints unless they've undergone the purification and permission. So you don't just come strolling in, been in the marketplace in Jericho, touching God knows what, dealing with all kinds of uh, uncleanness, ritually speaking, and you just walk in and sit down and eat with the teacher. You've got to go to the pool and uh, ritually cleanse yourself. You immerse yourself under the water, put on your linen robes, and enter into the community. That's their understanding of purity. This is the cemetery, and uh, the graves are oriented north-south. That's looking south. Here's that pool again. Are you with me? Here's cave four. Here's the complex, and here we have the cemetery, all-male cemetery, and this building that was discovered just recently. Uh, Shanks was involved in sponsoring that excavation. It's kind of controversial, but... The speculation is that somebody very important was buried up on that hillock. Maybe the teacher himself. Uh, who knows? But anyway, you, you see the layout. This is an aerial shot. And you, look, you can see, even in the picture, the cemetery, some of the mikvah, and the site itself. OK, if I'm standing at the site, and I look from the site to the northwest, can you see that bluff right there? This is the tower. So I'm looking northwest. I'm sorry, right here. See this right here? This is what got me intrigued and curious. If the community that wrote the scrolls is living at this site, they have their latrines outside the camp. I know this. I know it because of Josephus. I know it from the text. Text one, you've got it? A man shall not go about in the field to do his desired activity on the Sabbath. One may not travel outside his city more than a 1,000 cubits. So they've actually put a number on it for Sabbath journey, the Sabbath day's journey. This is mentioned in the New Testament. When Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives, Luke just comments to the reader, it's about a Sabbath day's journey from the city, right? If a cubit is 18 inches, you can kind of make an estimate in terms of yards, right? So you get... I mean, a, a yard and a meter are somewhat close, and so you think of a, a, a cubit would be, what, half a yard? So this is like 500-plus uh, yards, maybe. That's from the community rule. So there, they're simply reflecting an interpretation of the Torah where Moses says in Numbers, don't go outside your dwelling. And in Judaism, you always have to have discussions of what the mitzvot mean, right? In other words, if I say, don't go outside your dwelling on the Sabbath, you say, well, what's my dwelling? I was going to go in the garage. Is that okay? I was going to go in the driveway and get the mail. Well, you can't carry mail. Forget that. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. You see? So what's my dwelling? It has to be interpreted. So different sects of Judaism are interpreting it differently. This particular group, like the Pharisees, have actually come up with a number. You know, a thousand cubits. That puts you far enough away that clearly, you know, if you stand 500 yards outside of that settlement and you say, am I outside the camp? 
Yes. You went outside the camp. You're outside the camp, right? I don't think there'd be much dispute on that. Plus, they have a wall around the camp. Guess what? Sort of tells you, doesn't it, where the border is and the pool going in. Now, the next scroll is the war scroll. I'm not claiming these are all absolutely parallel. What I'm claiming is that the conceptual world is parallel. Because the war scroll is an apocalyptic prediction of the future when they believe they'll be marching in camps fighting the Romans. And what they're being told is when you're out in that apocalyptic battle, getting all your standards ready and your arms ready, and you set up these camps according to your tribes and your banners that you have, you've got to set up latrines at each stage of your journey. By the way, the word latrine in Hebrew, some of you know Hebrew, I know. Look in that first line. Le machom hayad. Machom, place, the place of the hand. The place of the hand. Translate latrine. Uh, we're not sure of the derivation of it. It's a euphemism. But we think hand refers to genitals, as it often can in Hebrew. Uh, and so the idea is the place of privacy, the place of intimacy, the place where you go to uh, go to the toilet, basically. Between all their camps and the latrine, about 2,000 cubits. Now, this is further. If you're out marching and you're under the apocalyptic strictures, I don't know if they're increasing the distance to just make it even holier, but it, what it does, it's no difference other than it's saying, we're going to be really sure that you know, these latrines are far away. That no shameful nakedness shall be seen in the environs of the camp. Now, you're not allowed to flash one another in the camp. Uh, one of the rules of the robes, the linen robes, what if I'm at prayer or I'm at the sacred meal and my robe comes open, you're naked underneath, or part of your chest shows or whatever, uh, you've exposed your body in an in a inappropriate way. Do you know any other religions that worry about showing necks, ankles, uh, arms, elbows, breasts, legs, I mean, I'd go on? I mean, this is not something unique. Uh, ask your great-great-grandmother or whatever, uh, who's probably not alive. But I mean, you know the traditions, uh, particularly in the southern United States and in certain Pentecostal churches, Orthodox Judaism, and so forth. Uh, nakedness is uh, not to be mixed with uh, the things of the temple. Why is the altar even fixed uh, with a ramp rather than steps? Because if you're raising, walking up steps with the robe, hiking your leg up each time, the priest, but if you're just walking up a ramp with the slow, and doesn't it say in the Torah, why do it that way? Lest the priest should expose his uh, nakedness to the altar, to the people watching. So it's this modesty. It's not a sexual modesty in terms of sexuality. It's, again, it has to do with the ritual purity. Don't mix the human, the ordinary, the mortal with the immortal and the holy and the divine. So that's a very interesting thing because it says no nakedness will be seen. And, uh, you know, that happens to be northwest. So we're going to begin to kind of close the circle here. Now, this will take you a minute to orient yourself because all of a sudden we went up to the satellite area. Here's the site. Here's that pool, okay? We're so high up, you can't tell, but that, that would be K4 right there. Are you with me? Now, here's the cemetery. If you walk toward that area you just saw, there's that little bluff that you saw in the picture right there. You can't tell from the perspective here, but you see it's quite a hike out there. Definitely, you got your 1,000 cubits. So in 96, I was studying this, teaching it, thinking about it. I was digging at Sephiroth with Jim Strange. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to find those latrines at Qumran because I believe these people were following the halakha. And I knew about this bluff. I'd seen it before, and it just hit me like an idea. And I, on the weekend, took a couple of my students, drove down to Qumran. Uh, I think Sheila Bishop was with me that day and five or six other students. We went down there. 
and we uh, walked around, and they got kind of bored because I'm I'm looking. I wanted. What am I going to see? Something. I want to see something. And after a while, I began seeing things. <laughs> and I took another time. Charles was with me. I think he was wandering over in these cliffs looking for caves. <laughs> I was still walking in this, what we call area A. Now remember this, area A, area B, 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 because I'm going to talk about the soil samples in a minute. Um, this, is another, this is a picture I took back then, so it's kind of faded. But as you walk, there's a path that goes around this bluff, and you end up back around here. Here's a, another site, uh, Qumran, K4. See the bluff right here? So you walk out like this, you go around here. To me, it just, it had to be the place. It's northwest, as we're going to see in a text. It's uh, a 1,000 cubits at least, and it's hidden from the camp. I mean, it just seemed like, it, you know, we got to, but the question is, could we find anything? Well, there I am behind the bluff looking for the latrines, and I saw... And, you know, it's real hard. I have to go back with a ladder and take the right light at sundown. But I, I drew it that day. I'll show you the drawing I made. I saw two what I think are cubicles, stalls, right up here. And this whole area looked to me like uh, it, was, it was just worth probing or being interested in. But right here where I'm standing, I could see the outlines of stones. This is what it looks like as you walk up. Uh, you come up through this path. This is actually where Zayas took the samples right here. I'll get to that in a minute. See his little spade there? As you come up around here, uh, this is the path. Uh, that, I think, is in my attempt to show you the stalls, but you're going to have to trust my drawing. Drawings are always better, right? Uh, this was in 98. I'd done it first in 96. I returned with Mike Friends and McKinney to two of my friends, and we went, and we did a more thorough survey. This is one meter. This is two meters. The stones are laid like this, and you've got, and the camp would be back down this way. So you would be going around and inside like this. So the idea I had was this should be dug right here. That is, we should do samples in that area. Uh, Zayas, at some point, with a team uh, did some radar ground scan and in that area, those stall areas in there, and they didn't see any structures. I don't think there's going to be deep structures. I did, uh, you're not allowed to dig, so I can't even remove a stone. I mean, you really shouldn't, because if, it, if this is a site, you don't want to be start moving things around. But I peeked. You know, I took my trowel and sort of looked to see, is there another stone under the stone? And it's two layers, but I don't think it's, you know, a wall or anything like that. It's very primitive. This is Joe Zayas. Uh, Joe's the one who tested, you know, the skeletons and showed they were all male. Um, he's an anthropologist. He's retired from the IAA. He was the curator of the Rockefeller Museum. Joe was in charge of the Israel State Collection, basically. So he does know uh, his material quite well. And I Gave him my latrine theory years ago, and we just never did anything about it. I've given bar lectures now for 15 years on the latrine theory, and people said, oh, Tabor's back. He's looking for his latrines. But um, I wasn't sure how to go about it because uh, you're not going to get a license to dig at Qumran without lawsuits. And over the years, I've told a few people, but Joe finally uh, determined his wife works for uh, Yitzhak Magain, and uh, that taking soil samples is not um, considered intrusive. You know, there's a, you're not moving any structures or anything like that. And so he decided to take the soil samples. He would go down just about uh, a few centimeters. You can see there one of his samples. Now, go to the third text, which is the 11Q, the temple scroll. This is the ideal future. So we got the community rule, the apocalyptic war, but what will it be like in the, when the kingdom of God comes in the future, the ideal future? They must sanctify and reverence my temple, for I dwell in their midst. You are to build them a precinct for latrines outside the city. 
They shall go out there on the northwest of the city. This will be in the future in Jerusalem. And roofed houses with pits inside into which the excrement will descend so as not to be visible. The outhouses will be 3,000 cubits from any part of the city. 1,000, 2,000, but in the ultimate holiness, 3,000, which is really a walk. So in sort of like Jerusalem someday, but we got some more data. Northwest is an interesting direction. It might have to do with winds. It might have to do with other notions of holiness. It might have to do with practicality. Jerusalem's a lot like Qumran. Have you thought about it? If you go south, Hinnom Valley. If you go east, Kidron, right? If you go west, it doesn't look like it now, but that's a very steep incline down to the road, if you've ever stood up along that wall. The only way you can go is northwest. So Qumran's the same way. So maybe northwest is no theological thing at all. Maybe it's just practical. It could have to do with the wind. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm open to other theories. But anyway, uh, there you get the idea of structures. So I don't think it's beyond the question that they might have had little uh, behind that bluff, these structures that I think I've located. That hasn't been tested yet. To test that, you would want to do a full-scale square. Some of you have been on digs. You'd want to do a five-by-five-meter square. Take it down, certainly a meter or two, and you would absolutely test every bit of that soil. So Joe took the samples. He took all of those areas you can read about in the news reports. What he found was quite uh, amazing. Uh, three particular kinds of parasites that... Uh, he's elaborated in those news articles, and also we published an article in Review de Qumran and uh, other sources. But this one, uh, these three in particular are found in latrines. They're also found in one of the latrines at the site of Qumran. Uh, so they are signs in every uh, anthropological area that Joe knows about of uh, toilets. As you, you get these organisms where you get toilets. Now, there are other possibilities. Bedouin, somebody suggested. DeVoe's team. You know, maybe they went behind the bluff to go to the toilet. Yeah, we have to ask them if they were here. But did they have tapeworms and diarrhea? These are organisms associated with uh, serious diseases, diarrhea, dysentery. What's happening, we think, is they're coming in from the latrines. Remember, they're digging holes and burying the excrement. That's good if you're camping out in the woods of North Carolina, where I'm from, or even Virginia, and you're just in a little area, you bury the waste and go on. But if you are living somewhere for 150 years and you have one little area you're using, probably not a good idea to bury the waste. Because over the years, uh, Joe's gone into all the technicalities of this, those organisms live in the soil. Joe said it becomes a kind of toxic waste dump. You're wearing sandals. Then you're going into the mikvah and coming back out again, eyes, nose, face, any physicians here? And you're getting down into the water and coming back out again and infecting yourself. Our latest speculation on that toilet inside, there is one toilet inside the settlement. Jody Magnus has talked about it, a whole chapter on it, Locust 51. Joe suggested this. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, he said, emergencies. Emergencies, and we think there might have been a lot of them. Uh, what are you going to do? You know, God would understand <laughs> if you're sick. Uh, they make allowances. Uh, so Joe has now done a whole anthropolo anthropology of the site, including cemetery material, and he and longevity, and he's determined that the skeletons. All this will be published in the Review de Qumran article that the skeletons at Qumran, the ones we've sampled, uh, these people are not living past 30. Now, I know you've heard, oh, in ancient times, nobody lived to 30 or hardly 30 or 40. That's not true. People lived to 50, 60, 70 regularly if they were healthy and if they had the proper hygiene. <coughs> the Bedouin uh, bury, uh, do not bury their uh, waste. Uh, they realize that's not a good thing to do in the desert because they camp for extended periods. And just in a matter of days, it disappears, the sun and the heat and the, the dryness. 
it's the Senate, it's the way to do it. But this group is located in the same place for decades and decades and decades. And the organisms we found in area one, oh, by the way, the other area is sterile. Area B, one, two, three, which could have been possibly used. They have no evidence of this. In all the samples that he took in area A, he found evidence of these organisms. They match the organisms in the latrine. So one other thing, and then I'll let you ask questions. On the second page, the war scroll, Josephus does describe the Essenes like this. He admires them. He says they don't even go to the toilet on the Sabbath because they're so holy. Apparently he did. He said on other days they dig a small pit. This is War Scroll 2, 148. A foot deep. That's pretty deep. With a paddle. Which kind of a hatchet is given them when they're first admitted? And covering themselves round with their garment that they may not affront the divine rays of light, they ease themselves into the pit. After which they put the earth that was dug out again into the pit. And this they do in the more lonely places which they choose for this purpose. Although this easement of the body is natural, yet it is a rule with them to wash themselves after it as a defilement, ritual defilement. It's not to get clean, it's just I'm going back into the camp. So we are working on this hypothesis that uh, this latrine helps to identify whoever lived there. Army camp, clay factory, Roman villa, but they're being pretty strict on Jewish law. To me, it supports the Essene um, theory somewhat. <laughs>